It's Rob Berger, and I need a haircut. It's kind of kind of out of control. Hope everyone is doing well tonight. Um, as always, give me a thumbs up in the chat if you can hear and see me. That would be great. I um, we're going to start off tonight. I, I've, I get more email um, about fixed income, CDs, brokered CDs, treasury uh, bills, treasury bonds, bond funds. Thanks for the thumbs up, Mike, Steve, appreciate it. Crispin38, welcome back. Um, it's amazing, like, like, because of everything that's gone on in the bond market this year, uh, it's just a new thing. Uh, you know, because in prior years, yeah, you'd get questions. I'd get questions, and, uh, you know, particularly on the asset allocation, how much should I allocate to bonds or whatever. But it's just crazy because of all the, the things that are going on in the market. So, uh, that's what we're going to start with, and I'll just jump right into it. Um, by the way, I guess it's sort of in the way of an announcement. I hope you all keep emailing me, as many of you do, particularly those that subscribe to the newsletter. There's a link below this video, by the way. If you haven't subscribed, you can. It goes out every Sunday morning. And I encourage people to reply to that newsletter and email me. And I say in there, I read every email. That is true. Sometimes it takes me longer than I would like. But I, I made the decision on Sunday, yesterday. I have been working hard to get through all of my email. So my plan was I'll, I'll, I'll deal with all email the day it comes in, but I still had a backlog of like 500 email. Uh, and then I was going to start chipping away at that 500, responding to every single one. I just can't do it. I, I, so I just said not. <laughs> the odds of you getting a reply from me going forward are slim to none. Now, I still read every email. And if there's a topic, and I think it makes sense for uh, a live show like tonight or a, a, a separate video or whatever. Uh, in fact, the, the question that we're going to talk about tonight came from Jan, who might, might be watching. Hope she is anyway. Um, you know, I just said she. I don't actually know that it's a she. In any event, Jan, someone named Jan. So uh, please keep e emailing me. A lot of folks send me emails with resources. Hey, did you see this article or this study? That's all great. I just I just have to give up. I can't I can't do it. So it's unlikely that you're going to get a response from me, but know that I do read them. Now, if, if the day ever comes where there's too many, I just can't read them all, I will tell you. Um, but so far, that's not the case. All right. So here's the question. I, by, I, by the way, I've got my tea here, hot tea, but I'm kind of cold. It's like, it's like a, a chill went through the air here. It's like I'm wondering if the, if the person that owns this, this place paid the heating bill. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll get started. Um, well, actually, no. You know, I've got a scarf. Let's see. I've got this scarf right here. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, yeah. I can just wear this scarf. Let's see here. Here we go. There it is. I'm trying to see. There's all these years written on it. I'm not quite sure what that means. Here it is. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Oh, this is so much better. Some of you are watching like I think this guy's lost his mind. What is he doing? Others of you, or the, the other half of you are saying, yeah, but they're going to get killed by Georgia. Yeah, but at least, as Teddy Roosevelt would say, we're in the arena, baby. All right. Enough of that nonsense. Is anyone still watching? You probably all just clicked off. You're like, I'm done. Uh, all right. Here's the question from Jan. And I'll take this off now because it's actually not cold in here, and this makes me hot. All right. With CDs closing in on 5% yields, why should we invest in bonds which show volatility and historical returns of bonds are in the 4 to 6% range? Anyway, why not build a ladder of various CDs for the portfolio stability and income instead of bonds, particularly for retirement purposes? Well, it's an interesting question. And I suppose at some level you could, right? There's, you know, you, you have to deal with FDIC insurance limits depending on how big your portfolio is. You know, you can go to things like brokered CDs and they have ways to give you FDIC uh, coverage beyond the typical 250,000. Of course, you could open up CDs at different banks. Uh, and there are other ways to, to get greater than 250,000 in FDIC insurance. But keep in mind that all of those things uh, add sort of complexity to the portfolio and work you have to do as opposed to just sticking your money in a bond fund, right? So 
you know, you keep that in mind, but you certainly have to be mindful of that, right? So that's the first thing. Um, 5%, so let's, I actually looked at the, the CDs. This is on the Fidelity uh, website, which I'll show you. We've looked at this many times. Now, these are what are called brokered CDs, but for our purposes, it, it doesn't much matter. You can see, I was kind of surprised out here in the five to 10 year range to see yields of 5%. Uh, because if you look at the treasury market, the yields aren't nearly as high. If we go, if we go back, you know, three, six, nine months, a year, two years, the treasury market and the bond market and the uh, CD market. And by the way, the reason I'm comparing these two is versus like a corporate bond is that they're basically backed by the federal government. They're backed by the federal government in a different way, but right. Uh, the CDs are FDIC insured. Obviously the treasury bonds are, are issued by the U S and the U S obligation. But you can see these yields more, you know, they're, they're different a bit, but they're pretty much in line with one another until you get out to about three years. And then they start to um, a little bit deviate. But then really here, I'm really surprised that CDs are at five, 5.1 uh, at five and 10 years out, which at least based on the market today is a pretty good deal. Now, I, I'm not, not sure how comfortable I would be locking money in for that long. I guess I'd have to look at the penalties for early withdrawal. But, but it's a significant difference, um, which would make, you know, at this, at this maturity, would make the CDs, um, you would think, a, a better deal. Uh, keeping in mind that both brokered CDs and treasuries, can, the, the, the values can go up and down as, as, as yields change. The thing to keep in mind, so this is an inverted yield, right? The 10-year, they often compare the 10 and the 2. Normally these longer maturity bonds pay a higher yield than the shorter maturity bonds, right? Uh, and the reason they don't right now, I'm just checking the chat here. My mom's texting me, asking me if my show is tonight. It is, and she missed my whole Ohio State Buckeye scarf thing. Very disappointing. In any event, what what this what this tells us is the the bond market thinks that for now the Fed's going to be raising rates, which they have been and will continue to do, in, in the relative short term. Think next year or so, but that's going to eventually cause a recession. Maybe next year, maybe the year after. And when that happens, you know pro productivity is going to go down, and eventually, at some point, the Fed will lower yields, right? to to stimulate the economy and that's why for longer dated maturities out here say 5 10 20 years uh, and i guess even 30 the yields are much lower so if you were wanting some sort of 5 or 10 year obligation these actually don't look too bad to me and we can think about these if we want to go to uh, a bond fund we can look at say a bnd total bond market fund and if we go to the portfolio, of the, so we can look at the yield. So it's 422. So someone asked me today, I was going to do a short YouTube short. I didn't get to it. What's the difference between the SEC yield and the 12-month yield? So the 12-month yield is just, you know, the interest that the fund has paid out over the last 12 months divided by its price. The SEC yield looks at just the last 30 days of interest, but then calculates an annual yield, sort of as if for a full 12 months, the the, pay, the the interest that the fund paid out was what happened in the last 30 days. Actually, I think it's the last full month is what they do. So th that's why they're so different because yields have been rising over the last year. If they'd been going down, uh, the SEC yield could very well be lower than the 12 month yield. And, and if the yields had basically kind of stayed flat, then these two numbers could be very similar. <clears throat> so when I'm looking at a bond fund, I'm typically paying more attention to the SEC yield personally, but in any event, um, we can look so, but keep that 422 in mind. So if we go to the portfolio and we look at the duration, it's six and a half years. Okay. So what we can say, there's sort of a general rule of thumb that, that, that basically over the duration of the fund and some, there's, there's one formula where it's duration times two minus one. We don't need to get into all of that exactly, but you can expect the fund during that time period as, as, as prices go up and down and rates change, because <clears throat> remember when when rates go up, the value of the bond fund is going to go down, but it's going to benefit from higher yields over time. So it kind of it kind of 
not right away, but over time, they sort of offset each other. And, and it's that what's that over time? Well, the duration of the fund times two minus one. If you hold it for what would that be? We'll call it 12 years, which by the way, it seems like a long time, but if you know, you're investing even in retirement, you know, if you just retired, you might be investing for 30 years, right? So, and certainly if you're younger than that, you haven't retired yet, but you have some bond exposure, I have no concerns over a duration of six and a half years. And then the math I just walked through. You could, but the point is you can kind of expect the fund to return that, that its current yield for we'll call it 4%. So when I look at CDs that are paying 5%, I, these, I'm, I'm not going to buy them, by the way, but it's not because I think these are bad deals. Let me go back to them. I'm looking at these here. It's, I just don't want the complexity. And I just realized you probably can't even see that. They're so small. I'll try to make them a little bigger. I just, I don't want the complexity of buying CDs, but I don't think in this context, it's necessarily a, a bad thing to do. Um, I don't know how much I would do a ladder. So the idea traditionally of a ladder would be, well, we can use this as a perfect example. We might want the 5% of a five year, right? But we don't want the penalty, right? We, we, so with CDs, there's a penalty and a stick or a carrot and a stick. The carrot for longer term CDs is this nice yield, right? Compared to shorter term. We like the yield, that's the carrot, but there's a stick that comes with it and that's the early withdrawal penalty. So the idea might be, and, and, and the spread here is very, very small between one and five years. So it, it maybe doesn't even matter. Often the spread is much greater than what we're seeing now. You would buy like a one, a two, a three, and they don't have it here, but a four and a five year CD. And then the idea would be when your one year CD matured, you would take it and buy a, buy a five year. And when the two year, a year later matures, you'd take the, the proceeds, buy a five year. Same thing with three and four. So after four four years, effectively, all you own are five-year CDs, earning the rate you wanted, right? And of course, the rate could change over, over that time, but earning the five-year rate, whatever it is, but you still have a stick. There's still early withdrawal penalties, but uh, you at least have a, a CD that matures once a year. So you're at least getting some of your money back if you needed it. If you didn't, you could just reinvest it in a five-year. I, what I walked through was a yearly CD ladder. You could do a six, you could do, do one every six months. So for five years, you'd have 10 CDs. I've never done a, a CD ladder in part because I just don't want to fuss with all of that that I just described. I don't think they're a bad thing. Um, whether they will end up being a better way to go than say a simple total US bond fund. I don't, I, there's no way to know. There's no way for me to know, for anyone to know. I do think those rates are pretty competitive though. So um, Jan, I don't think it's a, a bad idea. I think it can be a cumbersome way to go. So you have to kind of be, be prepared for that. And you've also got to think about FDIC insurance. Um, and I'm sure there are other issues that I haven't even thought about that folks in the chat will bring up. I did see someone asking about my shoulder. I appreciate it. Look at this, huh? Huh? I did yoga today. It's pretty good. Cortisone shot helps. Um, which I had to get, which I'm not a fan of. It's my second one in my life, not in my shoulder. Um, all right. So I, I did have another question. This is from our uh, our one and only Noreen. So I can't I can't ignore this email. She says, uh, "Can you discuss this on the next live show? Vanguard is now offering an FDIC insured way to keep cash in your account. Seems like it would be better than the money market fund, which has an expense ratio of 11 basis points." And a, and a year to date return of 1.23%. Um, so here's the, let me show you what she's talking about. So they, they came up with this FDIC insured account at Vanguard. It's currently paying two six. Now the money market fund she's talking about is this one. And this is where we need to, to compare or, or understand the difference between year to date returns. So remember this year to date return includes January, for example, when interest rates were a lot lower than they are today, right? Uh, or February. I mean, as we know, rates have kind of risen throughout the year eh, for the most part. Um, if we actually go down and look at the SEC yield, which gives you a sort of a better idea of sort of the current rate, you'll see it's 3.7. So if I were at Vanguard, uh, well, if, 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 if I wanted to hold cash at Vanguard, 
I would probably pick this federal money market fund over, over the cash deposit account. And if I wanted a cash deposit account, I, you know, it, 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 for anything other than short term, I mean, maybe I just park some cash here because, you know, you're, maybe you're going to be buying an ETF and you, but you're not ready and you need to park some cash in Vanguard and you're going to buy it next week. Well, that's fine. Put it in here. But if I like wanted something longer term, like, so this is my site, all cards. If we go to savings accounts, you know, we do better than two, six. Here's UFB 391. Basque is 385. In fact, you know, at 260, you know, at least, and, and I think I have most of the high paying savings accounts that are sort of available nationwide. I'm sure I'm missing some, but to get to two, I mean, look at all these that, are, that beat 260. My goodness. They'd be all the way down here, just above Morgan Stanley Private Bank, uh, but underneath Colorado Federal Savings Bank. So, you know, I think it might be fine for like short term if you've just, you know, you're keeping some cash there for a few weeks or something. But longer term, if I, if I wanted to hold some cash at Vanguard, I personally would probably prefer, at least right now, this, maybe this changes over time, but the federal money market fund. But it's a great question. Um, all right, I got a couple more things. Uh, someone asked me, this is another email that I got that I, I don't think I responded to. I'm responding now. Hopefully they're watching the show. They wanted to know, is there a, a calculator to help you calculate the portion of your social security that will be taxable. I don't know how accurate this calculator is, but I found one. And if you just Google, whoops, taxable social security benefit calculator, you'll get this. It seemed fairly easy to use. I confess I didn't test it in part because I'm not getting social security. But there you go. Man, I'm just ticking these off one after another. Um, and then I wanted to... Uh, one last thing before I get to your questions. Shredder says cortisone just masks the pain. Uh, I'm not a doctor. Maybe you are. Um, I don't see it that way. Cortisone, it, it reduces the inflammation. Uh, it actually doesn't, from what I can tell, mask the pain. The pain goes down because the, infl the, the, the inflammation goes down. Um, I took one they gave me a, a pain pill that included an anti-inflammatory. I took one of them. I'm not a big, I don't like taking that kind of medicine. I don't know if this was super powerful. It's not like it, it knocked me on, on my keister or anything. I took one just to sleep one night because the pain, the pain was so bad I couldn't really sleep. Uh, but then the cortisone, I guess, shot kicked in. I don't know. We'll see. I hopefully, hopefully it's all good. Now you got me, now you got me nervous. All right. So. Um, I wanted to walk through a portfolio review with you guys. And um, so this is going to get a little messy, but we'll do it together. So I, all I did was cut and paste what, what they gave me. So I'm going to have to, so this is 61%. We're going to take this one and put it down here and it's 9%. Okay. Whoops. We know VBTLX, right? We've talked about that one. Of course, it's also BND, same fund, uh, just one's an ETF, one's a mutual fund. Um, we'll take a look at this one, which is 3%. And is, I guess this is a, is this a fund or is it literally I bonds? Hmm. I'm not sure what they meant by I bonds. They might have literally meant I bonds. So I'm not sure what I'm going to do about that one. Because <laughs> you can't really model that in. Uh, I know what I can do. Won't be perfect, but this is seven. So this is this is inflation protected. I'm just going to add the um, extra 2% to that. All right. Now, the problem with portfolio visualizer is. Some of these, we'll see how much data they give us. Ah, this is cash. How much data do we get? Oh, we get 10 years. See here, January. That's not terrible. So let's just think about this. Let's, let's ignore the returns for a minute. 
So this is 61% total US market, right? That's a low cost index fund, love it. International growth, it's interesting that they picked a, a growth version, but okay, 9%. And so that's 70%, so this is a 70-30 portfolio. 18% um, total bond, 5%, uh, again, I was three and two, but we'll call it 5% in inflation protected bond, 7% in cash. Now, the first question is, is that st what, what do we think about the stock bond allocation? And um, my take on that, and let me see. Well, look at that. I'm going to get fancy, put, my, put myself up in the corner. Uh, I think a 70-30 is, a, is a, a reasonable allocation for retirement. It's probably a reasonable allocation, in my view, my opinion, if you're getting near retirement. Now, you could have a, a ton of different circumstances that would make it not as reasonable, right? Um, depending on, you know, Social Security, pensions, inheritance that you expect, if any. Uh, you know, are you going to work part-time in retirement? So all kinds of factors. So we're talking just at a high level. I think if you were, you know, in your 20s or 30s or 40s, I would personally not think this is risky enough. 30% 30, 30 bonds would be too much for me. Um, and I don't remember if the person who sent this to me, his name is Kathy. I don't remember anything specific about Kathy. I mean, I could go find my email. I keep all of my email, but it's not really important for our purposes. I'm not trying to give her any specific advice. None of what I say is specific advice on this show. It's, <laughs> I don't know what it's for, entertainment purposes, I guess, any, any event. So let's assume this is a retirement portfolio. I, I personally would not tilt my international towards growth. I don't think this is some massive mistake. Uh, I would probably just have a, a standard international, total international fund. I wouldn't tilt it towards growth. I personally would probably have a little more than 9% in it. But again, I don't think this is unreasonable. I like both the not what they would call nominal bonds, the total bond market fund. They got 5% in, 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 in inflation protected bonds. You know, one could argue maybe you should even this up a bit uh, and put more in, in tips and I bonds. But I, I still think this falls within reasonableness. The only question I would have is why 7% in cash? That seems like a lot to me, unless, you know, part of that is because you need to spend some of it this year or in the next 12 months. But that would be a big question for me is why is there so much in cash? But overall, I think this could certainly be a reasonable portfolio depending on, you know, the specific circumstances and your goals. Yeah, that's my take. So uh, let's get to your questions. I do have a poll. for you guys. I have to just put the answers in. Let's see here. What are what are my options going to be? I got one of them. Okay, we'll use this one. Here's the question. For those of you that use tax software, you know, to do your taxes, my question is, what do you use? Now, I can only add four options here. So I'm certainly going to miss options that you use, and there's nothing I can really do about that. But let's see here. Ah, of course. One more. Here we go. My plan this year, so I, I pay someone to do our taxes, but my plan is to actually do my own taxes with like four or five different pieces of software, you know, TurboTax, H&R Block, whatever. And then um, one, compare the outcome with my accountant, but then also share the results with you, give you my views on, I don't know, which ones I like the best. In the past, when I did do my own taxes, which has been a long time now, I used H&R Block, or I'm sorry, TurboTax. So from Janderson, 182, greetings from Madison, Wisconsin. Congrats on the Buckeyes making the CFP. What are your thoughts on Wisconsin hiring Luke Fickle? I didn't know they did. I don't know. I'll have to give that some thought. I, I guess I haven't been following the news. I didn't even know like his history beyond Ohio State. I, I don't I have I don't have any I, I don't have a clue. Um 
Yeah. By the way, for those that are wondering, like, what's going on with Ohio State, you probably don't care if you don't know. But they had the best weekend of their season this past weekend, and they didn't even play. USC lost. And because of that, Ohio State is in the playoffs. And now there's a little controversy on the uh, TCU is is ranked third, even though they lost. And some people say, well, if if they were, you know, isn't Alabama better? I mean, I get it. The problem is Alabama lost twice, but anyway, it doesn't really matter. It is what it is. I mean, it would matter if Ohio, if Alabama was in and Ohio State was out. Then it would then it would matter. But no, it doesn't really matter. Okay. So Nicholas says, you know, a lot of t- we talk a lot about small cap value. Any opinion on mid cap though? Uh, not a strong opinion. I, you know, uh, certainly I think if you want to um, increase your allocation to, to mid cap or mid cap value, it's not an unreasonable approach. One thing I remember, and I don't know, maybe I can put my hands on it. I think I can. I don't know if this is true now. So S&P, Dow Jones, does this report every year about how uh, actively managed funds have performed relative to, you know, the index or passive investing. And um, let's see, here's the the website. And we're looking at 15 years. So you have different, you know, time periods. We look at 15 years. So in, over the last 15 year period, roughly 90% of funds have underperformed the S&P 500, right? You might say, well, that's fine, Rob, but what's this got to do with mid cap? Well, you can view more categories and I'm curious how mid cap performed. So all mid cap right here. Yeah. The underperformed at the 15 year mark. Um, but notice at five years, you know, not it's still 58% underperformed, but it's close to 50, 50, at least for five years. Whereas large cap, you know, 84% fell short, 74 small cap fell short. Why, why does mid cap seem to do better at least to a point? And then of course it falls off here. And I wonder if we can see mid cap value. See mid cap value doesn't quite hold up quite as strong. Oh, here we go. Here, look at mid cap growth, 36%. So, but again, you get to 15 years and not so good. Uh, I, I I don't know why, but I've noticed this in the past, which is why I went to it in light of your question, that at least for a not insignificant amount of time, mid cap funds in some form, growth, value, seem to do better uh, compared to the indexes than the other thing, the other squares on the t- on the Morningstar style tic tac toe board, right? I don't know why that is, but in any event, I tend to invest mid cap just through a, a, a total market fund. Um, you know, if we look at, um, here we go back, let's go to, uh, we'll look at um, uh, VTI and we can see, we can see how much of VTI is in mid caps. It's around 20%, I think. Yeah, 19% right here, the the, the middle the middle row of our tic tac uh, board, tic tac, tic tac toe board. Uh, I don't personally feel a need to add more exposure to that for me, but I don't, I can't say doing so would be unreasonable. I, I can tell you historically, small cap value has done the best. I mean, we can, we can actually look at that too, real quick. Of course, I say that with before I actually look at the data. So maybe I'm wrong. As I tell my wife, it happened once before. It could happen again. She just kind of tolerates me at that point. All right. U.S. small cap value, U.S. mid cap value. I, I use, by the way, let me actually go back for a second. You can you can use the back test portfolio right here and actually put in tickers. Oh, and that's right. VJ from Michigan wanted me to explain this. So uh, hope he, hopefully he's watching. So you can put in tickers, right? The problem with putting in a ticker, let's put in VU, for example. The, the downside is that you could be very limited in your data. So, you know, VU goes back 10 years. Uh, you could put in the mutual fund version of that same fund. It goes back further, but you're still limited by, you know, whenever the fund started. I'm working on a video on covered call ETF. You, you wouldn't believe the number of 
emails I get about Jeppy, if that's how you want to pronounce that ticker. Um, there's some others, uh, but it's, you know, we've only got like 30, 23 months of data, right? So anyway, uh, if you go to an, uh, and and to base the backtest asset allocation link, so again, it's the one here, you're going to get data in for most asset classes back to 1972. Now, I don't know if that's true with mid cap value and small cap value, but we're going to find out. So to, to VJ to your question, you could just create your portfolio using asset classes and you'd get data back to 72. And by the way, if you click one of these drop downs, you can plug in um, a, a number of lazy portfolios, right? Like if you picked in, we'll just pick this one. It, it, it picks the asset classes and puts them all in there. No, we'll leave that in. Why not? So this only goes back to 2007 because of commodities. So I'm going to get rid of this. This caused the problem. Yeah, commodities is one of the asset classes that's limited in data. So let's ignore that last portfolio. Okay, yeah. So this goes back to 72. Um, and mid cap did well, 4.4 million, but small cap was 6.7. By the way, you know what we can do here? Let's just do one for US stock market. It's probably going to underperform both of those. Yeah, 1.5. So mid cap value and small cap value significantly outperformed total US market over the last 50 years. Now, there have been long periods of time where they have not. The last 10 years might be an example of that. If we come here and we say, well, let's put in whatever, 2010. Yeah, the of course, much smaller dollars, but the US, total U.S. market outperformed. So, you know, I, I, it gives you just a sense of what's happened. What you do with that data, I don't know. It's probably more than you were bargaining for, Nicholas, but... That's my take on mid cap value, whatever help that is. Terry, you're welcome on the timestamps and uh, credit there needs to go to my good friend, Matt, who does those. He gets them to me like the night of the show. He's listening right now. Hey, Matt. Uh, sometimes I don't get them actually posted till tomorrow. So that's on me. So John Doe, I'm guessing that's not his real name, but it could be. Can you imagine if your name was John Doe? Anyway, he says, a close friend became an agent for HGI. I have no idea what that is. I guess I could Google it. It's probably some insurance company. Hartford, maybe? Hartford Group Insurance. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe not. He's giving compelling arguments about partially rolling over my 401k to their fixed index annuity, assuring high returns after age 65. Your advice? Well, they can't assure high returns. It's not how indexed annuities work. They can't. Um, so my advice would be speak to a financial advisor, take all the information from your friend, Take it over to a financial advisor who's going to just bill you by the hour and who doesn't sh sell fixed fixed index annuities or any kind of annuity and get their advice. But when they go through the, the when they go through the sales pitch, they've got the, 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 they're they're using assumptions that may not prove to be true. Uh, and it's very difficult. Frankly, it would be very difficult for me to know all of the questions to ask in a sales pitch, which is why I would never make a decision. Well, I would never be in that kind of meeting. <laughs> but if I found myself in that kind of meeting, um, I certainly wouldn't make a decision. Now, I'd be asking a lot of questions. Um, but yeah, I think I think fixed index annuities are, are generally, they're generally not, I think, ideal for the vast majority of people. And, and I just say that only because there's got to be someone out there where maybe it makes sense. But yeah, that's what I would do. Go go, to, go talk to someone who you trust. It could be someone you don't know. You got to find someone. And I've got a page on my site. Uh, in fact, I added a new advisor 
to my site this uh, this um, this week. But let me show you here. Um, where is it? Here we go. So if you just Google this, it's just a list of low cost financial advisors say no to 1% advisors. Uh, you know, I got Mark Zorl, we've talked about Rick Ferry. Uh, uh, Jack Zarinsky is the person I added. I met him at the Bogled conference. Um, and there's, you know, you'll see here. Now, don't, don't view any of these as my personal recommendation. That's not, you gotta do your own due diligence, but for something like what you're wanting, it doesn't have to be someone on this page either. I mean, but I think before I would, do anything like that, I, I would talk to a financial advisor who's not in the business of selling insurance, right? I mean, you don't want to, you don't want to ask an insurance salesperson whether you should buy insurance. It's like asking your barber if you need a haircut, and, you know, you're going to get one answer. Of course, in my case, I think anyone would probably say yes, but that's really not the point. Okay. Noreen, thanks for, for putting a link to the newsletter and she's good. Okay. Here's a, here's an interesting one. Um, what do you think about slowly averaging into uh, VCLT right now? Is that like a corporate long-term fund? I don't know. Let's look it up. I should probably know that, but I don't. Long-term corporate, that's what it is. I guess sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. Um, so. Current yield's 545. That's gone up a lot. Uh, what's its duration? Long term. 12. So um, all I can tell you is my approach to bonds. Um, I tend to put, and there are some exceptions, but I tend to put our bond portfolio in intermediate term bonds. I, I, I because I think I get I get most of the yield that you'll get from long term with less interest rate risk. By and large, obviously, over long periods of investing, uh, that's going to change from time to time. And and but my view, my thinking is, if I just keep it there and don't make changes, um, that's more or less what I think will happen. And I could try to stretch for some more yield with longer term bonds, but that's not really the point of my bond portfolio. I mean, I I, I would I do want to get some yield, but it, it's really. Um, I'm, I'm not really looking to take more risk. And if we go back to this fund, one thing that you can look at. So the standard deviation is a measure of, they call it risk. I would think of it as a measure of volatility, right? But 1541 is pretty significant, right? Um, so there's a lot of up and downs with this portfolio, with this, this fund. And if you look at performance, you know, it's got some good years. It's had some off years. This year has been bad, but you know, it lost 7% in 2018, lost 4%. It, you know, it's been up 23, up 10, down five here. And when you, when you look at, let's go to, um, so that had, had a, had a uh, standard deviation of 15. If we go to B and D, which by the way, includes corporate bonds, right? If we go to the portfolio, um, where is it? Yeah. It's got 51% government bonds. It's got, look, 26% corporate, right? Uh, but it's got a much lower duration, about half the duration of the fund you were looking at. And if we go to risk, you look at the standard deviation from 15 to, we'll call it six. To me, that's kind of what I want my bond fund to do. Now, you may have some other reason you want to invest in long-term corporate bonds. And by the way, I don't know, maybe they could turn out to be a great investment over the next, whatever, five, 10 years at that yield. I don't know. I guess it depends on what interest rates do. And also, you know, do we go into a recession or is there, are there more defaults? Um, but this is kind of more of what I'm personally looking for in a bond fund. Uh, so Troy wants to know if this is a good time for tax loss harvesting. Well, I think a lot of times people think about it now into the year. Are there any losses? I think any time can be a good time for tax loss harvesting if you have losses to harvest, depending on your tax situation. Um, I don't think, other than the fact that we're all thinking, well, 
we might start, you know, end of year tax planning and that sort of thing. I don't know that this particular time is better than any other, uh, except for your specific circumstances might make it better. Did I ever get to meet Malcolm Forbes? So let's pull him up. Here he is. There's Steve Forbes. I've met Steve Forbes. I haven't met Malcolm. Who, let's see, died in 1990. I, I rode the elevator with Steve once when I was um, working at Forbes. We had a pleasant chit chat on the way down to the first floor. <clears throat> All right. It's funny because I see your comments from like 20 minutes ago. Was I late tonight? Charles wants to know why I was late. I didn't think I was. All right. Peter Smith wants to know, should I purchase a six-month T-bill after they increase the rates in a few weeks or purchase them now? So here's the trick. I, I assume when you, what you mean by... <clears throat> increase the rates, you're talking about the Fed. The thing is, that doesn't necessarily mean that, that the yields on T-bills will go up. They don't work that way, right? Um, they, they might, uh, but, you know, it's a question of inflation. I mean, you know, a lot of times they'll raise the rates and then people think, okay, now they've got a handle on inflation. Like the inflation report might have a more significant effect on T-bill yields than the 50 basis points that I think everyone expects the Fed to, to, to raise the rate by. When is that? Is that this week? Maybe next. Um, so, you know, personally, I would just buy them when I want, when I wanted to buy them. I wouldn't try to predict what's going to happen. I mean, I don't think I would be surprised if the change in T-bill rates was significant, but I have been surprised before. That's my take on that. All right, now we've got another fund. Sharwin wants to know, what do you think of the BlackRock Life Path 2050 fund? Well, let's figure this out. So when I look at a fund, so 2050 fund tells me it's, you know, basically, they call it Life Path, but a target date retirement fund, I'm guessing. Um, they're the ones that have dates in the name. So, you know, it makes it easy. I'm going to retire in 2050. Let's buy the block, the BlackRock Life Path 2050 fund or the Fidelity 2050 or the Vanguard. Anyway, so the first thing I look at are expense ratios. This is 14 basis points. That's not terrible. You think you can find cheaper, uh, slightly cheaper target date, but I would. this wouldn't keep me from buying it. That's um, fairly inexpensive. And let's look at the portfolio. So it's uh, basically a 90-10 portfolio. I, I personally like that for someone looking to retire uh, 28 years from now. 90-10 I like. So I'm, 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 I'm good with that. Uh, now, how are they actually investing the money? So it's just a series of, or a series of ETFs, effectively iShares Russell 1000 large cap index. What else do they have? So uh, this is international. 35% international. That would be a concern for me. That's a little richer than I would want personally. I'm looking at this number right here. I don't know how well you guys can see that. Let me make it a little bigger. Um, that's more than I would want. I mean, if this were like available in a 401k and it just made the most sense of my other options, I would invest in this. But if I were an IRA, I wouldn't because I don't want 35% of my portfolio in international ETF. Um, the real estate five, th these sort of, let's put 1.85% in a long credit bond. I mean, it doesn't affect you because you don't have to rebalance this. But I always wonder like really 0.82% in a tips bond ETF, whatever. Um, I'm trying to figure out where it gets its, its, total bonds from this says going back to the top here cash of 5.39 percent but when i come down here 
I don't see that anywhere. But and maybe there's just some differences in timing. So that would be a question. When I look at this, this is 57, 80, 92. I mean, I, this is almost 100%, which even given it's a 2050 fund, might one could argue might be reasonable. But I would want to understand the exact allocation. And I'm not sure, something doesn't seem right here when I compare this to what we saw at the top of the page. So that would be something else I'd look at. But this is probably just from the data here would be something that would maybe trouble me. But that it, it, part of that just comes down to personal preference, right? Kalari says, you are a scream, nice scarf. Well, thank you. I had planned to also wear, put on my Ohio State jacket. It's of course all red and my Ohio State ball cap. Oh, yeah, maybe, maybe it's a little over the top. I don't know. Um, Kevin is getting bullish on long-term bonds. So here would be the case for long-term bonds in the short term. Yields have gone up, obviously. We just looked at the corporate, the corporate long-term bond. Uh, and the Fed is clearly going to do whatever it takes, as far as we can tell, to curb, you know, get their hands around inflation. When they do, everyone seems to think they're going to put the economy in a recession. Seems reasonable to me. And when and, and so then that's going to bring down prices. Uh, you know, it's going to increase unemployment. Uh, so people don't have, you know, aren't working, aren't getting paid, don't have money to spend. It's going to bring prices down. And what's going to happen? Yeah, you know, again, in the next year or two, let's say is they're going to have to start lowering rates to restart the economy. And when that happens, uh, long-term bonds uh, will do well as prices, as is, is, is yields go down, right? I guess that would be the theory. Now, who knows how long that lasts and what happens next and who knows? Um, I'm still not, I, my issue is not so much is our long-term bonds a good deal right now. It's just that I made a decision many, many years ago that they just weren't going to be part of my portfolio for the reasons I mentioned earlier. It's just, you know, it's like you got to make decisions, right? I mean, it's not like there's one answer to all of this. So, you know, you the, the key is for you to make a decision and stick with it. All right. So interesting question. SCHD, which is Schwab's high, uh, dividend fund, has done better than VU, which is an S&P 500 index fund this year, though it, though it paid a much bigger dividend. So if value goes down dollar for dollar when the dividend is paid, wouldn't that mean investors would find a better value in SCHD, those why it didn't go down as much as VU so even though the value went down, investors find it more attractive and buy. Well, I'm I'm, I'm not sure I'm totally following that question, but let's. But I, I I'll I think I can unpack this. So we can look at SCHD just to get an idea of what the fund is all about. So VU pays a yield of what one and a half, one two, one one point five, something like that. Um, SCHD has got a yield of over three. If we go to the portfolio. We can see some of the some of the companies they own. They own a hundred, ah, a hundred, exactly. Um, so anyway, so what happens is, when one of the companies that this fund or VU for that matter owns pays a dividend, say they pay a dollar a share, the exchange actually goes in and reduces its price by a dollar. Um, right, and it makes sense because the the, the company is just given a dollar of cash for each share. So they, they had whatever, they had $50 million in cash yesterday, and now they don't. <laughs> it's gone. And they didn't get anything for it. They just kept their shareholders happy. It's not like they got an asset. They didn't buy some equipment. So they, just, they effectively just gave away $50 million. So what are they worth the next day? Well, they're worth whatever, $50 million less. It, we often don't notice it. Because, you know, let's say it's paying a two or even 3% dividend, they're paid quarterly. So it's a relatively small amount. The 3% is yearly. So it's just a fourth of that getting paid each quarter, let's say. And 
a ton of other factors on a day-to-day -day basis can affect the price. So it's going to start trading. It might it might trade higher even after the dividend. It might, it might recover the amount of the dividend and keep going up that day. And by the way, for no reason related to that company at all, could be just the market. That, you know, the Fed said something, got everyone excited. Or it could go down and it, maybe it goes down 3%. It's got nothing to do with the dividend per se, but these things happen. We don't even really notice. So, um, you know, VU is going, the VU stocks that it owns uh, are doing the same, any fund stocks. I mean, that's what the stocks are doing. I think the reason, and I don't know what the performance of SCHD is this year, even though I own it, I haven't really been tracking the performance of a specific fund. So year to date, it's it's up actually 29 basis points, which is great for how other everything else is done this year. The reason for this, though, it would be a mistake to say it's done better than VU because it pays a higher dividend. Let me take the comment down. Right, the, the amount of the dividend of, in and of itself is meaningless. I know it's gonna a lot of people are gonna disagree. I'm probably gonna get some hate mail. <laughs> The reason it's done better is because it's a value-oriented fund and value stocks have done better. That's it. And, you know, interest rates go up. It's not uncommon for value stocks to fall like growth stocks, but not as much. Um, I'm sure there are exceptions to that. We go back in history and find all kinds of exceptions. I have no doubt, but um, that's the reason. At least that's my, my belief. You know, keep in mind that its valuations as 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 a based on a PE or price to book were much lower to start the year than VU or a growth fund like QQQ. I mean, what's its what's its? I've got too many computers here. I don't know which one to operate. What's its current um, PE? Thirteen. I think I think Morningstar uses a forward PE. Anyway, that's my take. Steve wants to know if I looked at Fidelity's new Fidfolios, um, which is kind of like M1, you know, where you can build your own basket of stocks or ETFs. At least that's my understanding. Let me see if that's correct. Maybe I should actually Google Fidfol. I like the name. The marketing team did a great job there. Yeah. I, I think this is great. I don't use it. Um, I don't know about the four ninety nine a month, but I guess that's not bad. I mean, M one is free, but you might prefer the more established fidelity with all of the other services it offers. Um, I, you know, one question would be why not just do a simple low cost, you know, index fund kind of portfolio where you don't pay the four ninety nine. But I also recognize that you know four ninety nine a month. I mean, particularly if you've got money to invest, is nothing. I guess it's an Americano at Starbucks. So the, you know, do have to consider that. I like the idea behind it, though. But the same reason I like M1 Finance, the idea behind it. Oh, this is an interesting question from Gary. He wants to know if the longer CDs are callable. So, um, and I think he's referring to the Fidelity CDs. Uh, I would have to log into my account to see that at, at, at any broker. I don't think, and in the case of Fidelity, I don't think they should tell you that. So I don't know that I can find that out, but you can think of a call, a call of a CD is a lot like your mortgage, right? So you, you borrow money to buy your home, uh, bank lends it to you. You don't think of that as a bond, but that's effectively the same thing. And it's callable and it's actually callable anytime. What that means is you can pay off the mortgage anytime you want, right? Without penalty, at least. In most cases, maybe there's some exceptions out there. Uh, and why would you do that? Well, let's say you got a 5% loan and rates go to 3%. I'm going to refinance. So you can tell your current bank, I'm paying the loan off. I don't want to pay your 5%. I'm going to refinance with 3%. Or maybe you move. Or you, you hit the lottery and you decide to pay off your mortgage. So corporate bonds can be callable in the same way. They're usually... Um, I've never, I've never invested in a callable bond, but there are usually um, parameters around when the bond can be called. Uh, and and uh, it, it sounds like a bad deal for an investor, right? Um, 
because you think, well, wait a minute, if it's callable, um, if rates go down, normally the value of the bond goes up, that'd be good for me, but if, not in this case, because the, the corporation, let's say, would just call the bond. True. But to offset that, they pay a higher yield. So, you know, it kind of, you know, cuts both ways. CDs could be the same way, I'm pretty sure. Um, but I don't know that there's any way to know that in the case of, yeah, there's no way to know that without, if you have an account at Fidelity, you can log in and look at that. All right. So Rob wants to know for a 70-30 retirement portfolio for the 30% bond part of an investment, is VGIT or BIV a good way to go? Well, let's take a look. So this is intermediate term treasuries. I think intermediate term treasuries are a good way to go. I think that's perfectly reasonable. Obviously, you know, a lot of other factors go into this analysis, whether 70-30 makes sense for you. But, it, you know, for any portfolio, if you wanted to put your bond exposure in intermediate term treasuries, which is what this is, I think that's a reasonable choice, in my opinion. And um, yeah, BIV is just, um, what is BIV? I mean, it's an intermediate term bond fund, but how is it different than BND? I've looked at this before. So, okay, the difference between this fund and BND is that BIV, BIV doesn't have um, mortgage backed securities, they, they don't have securitized bonds. And some will argue that's actually a good thing. You don't want the exposure to real estate in your fund. And this they would actually prefer this over B&D. I don't know. I think this is a reasonable choice too. I think they're both reasonable. That's my opinion. So... Dinesh wants to know, how do you stay disciplined and stick with an investment strategy? So it's interesting you asked me that question. I've, I've got a number of books that I want to write, and I've started several of them. And actually, this is part of what got me to the decision this weekend to stop replying to email. Is because I would be, it'd be much more productive to actually use that time to work on the books I want to write. One of them, and possibly the next one I, I publish, will be on this very question. How do you, you know, you always hear about you should be a long-term investor. And if you just own the S&P 500 for 50 years or whatever, um, and we hear stories about people, you know, such and such a teacher that no one thought had anything, just died and donated $4 million to the library. And no one had any idea that she had this money, or he had this money, and they invested in stocks they owned for 40 years. You know, so we kind of know that's the thing we should be doing, but boy, it's hard, right? Think about all the questions you guys throw at me and I get it via email. So many of them in some way or another are about market timing. They don't, they don't use those words. Lump sum versus DCA, right? Interest rates. Should I go long bonds? Should I go short? Should I, should I do CDs? How about just do one thing and stick with it? Right. It, it, it's it's really hard to do that. Um, so I'm working on that. I was working on that book today. Um, and I have a lot of thoughts about this. We'll see how it comes out when I actually write the thing. Um, I certainly think it helps to have to be somewhat of a stock market and bond market historian to have some idea of the ups and downs of the market and how difficult it is to predict. And when you think you understand what's going on and then you get surprised, we don't have to go back that far in time to see that. I mean, everyone was scared to death in March of 2020. Oh, the whole world shut down. Surely stocks aren't going to do well. <laughs> Surprise, they did well. Um, and, and so part of it's understanding that history. Uh, I think part of it is embracing index funds, actually. I think it's easier to be a long-term investor with index funds than it is with actively managed funds. 
because with actively managed funds, you got to worry about whether, did, you know, did the manager lose their, their magic, right? Do I stick with Kathy Wood or, you know, yes, she's down. People have lost billions, but maybe she's right about this. Maybe Bitcoin will be at a million dollars in 2030. Um, okay. That may be an extreme example, but that's what she says. Um, so, but there are a lot of other things. I think the things that we do outside of our portfolio, keep our debt uh, limited, if, if any, you know, particularly as you near retirement, consistently spend less than you make, even in retirement, if you can, um, never, uh, invest on margin. Um, it basically ignore the media, at least when it comes to investment advice, right? Uh, a lot of people make fun of Jim Cramer because he's gotten so many things wrong. But in some ways, I think, but wait a minute. I mean, he's entertainment. Was Is anyone actually taking him seriously in terms of listening to him so you can run out and buy a stock? I mean, maybe. Maybe. I don't know. And, and by the way, in some ways, uh, you know, Jim covers like every company out there. So of course he's going to be wrong a lot. <laughs> uh, I would be wrong a lot if if my job was to cover companies and give my opinion on whether I think it's a good investment or not. Um, but but part of it's ignoring all of that, uh, or, or or if you consume any of it, and I do some. It's just for entertainment. I have a section of my note taking app where I've started tracking predictions. I'll show it to you. You probably can't see it very well. Here it is. Let's see if I can make it bigger. City predicts rolling recessions in 2023. So I've got um, I've got the fortune teller. That's what I call them, City. This is when I want to look at this to see if they were right. End of next year. Uh, double digit drop in stocks in early 20, 2023. Who was that? Mike Wilson. No idea who he is. Uh, iPhones, you know, production will go down. Um, the stock market will have a Santa rally in December, 2022, uh, Bitcoin will hit, I just mentioned this a million dollars. Uh, that's Kathy Wood. She also, by the way, says it'll hit 500,000 by 2026. And someone who was this Tim Draper, I don't know who he is, says it'll hit 250,000 by mid 2023. Um, oh, this is another Kathy Wood product, uh, pr prediction. We're heading back to the roaring twenties. Boy, I hope not, because I remember what happened after that. Anyway, it's not a complete answer to your question. Um, I am, it is a question I'm giving a lot of thought to. Uh, and I think it gets harder in retirement because now, you know, you're relying entirely on that nest egg. Whew, it, it's, it's tough. So I'm working on it. So James mentions a multi-year guaranteed annuity. They call them MYGA, M-Y-G-A. I don't know how you want to pronounce that acronym. Um, the thing you have to keep in mind with these is there's big penalties if you take the money out early. Forget early. They're like early withdrawal penalties on steroids. Um, and I just never felt comfortable locking my money up for that. But if you're comfortable with that, some of these might not be a bad deal. I'm, I, I, you know, I'm... I'm uh, I'm never the, a fan of the word annuity, <laughs> but um, these seem to be fairly straightforward as long as you understand all of the limitations. But again, I've never bought one. So Jay mentions a good point on CDs versus treasuries. Depending on where you live, CDs will be taxed at the state level. Treasuries are not. So yeah, really good point. Thanks for mentioning that. All right. So Mike says, I've been recommending your book, Retire Before Mom and Dad. You know, it's funny. Someone asked me, why don't you talk about your book more on the live show? I, I don't know. I kind of figure you all have already know about it. I'll show it to you for those that don't. You just buy it on Amazon. I mean, other places sell it. You can, there is an audible version. I recorded that. So this is back in our old house. I had these bookshelves, you know, that I moved, you know, standing, standalone bookshelves. And I had draped these heavy, really heavy blankets. Uh, like some of them were moving blankets, that kind of blanket. And I had, I had this desk actually. 
and I set up the microphone. I was working with an engineer. Not She wasn't there. I, I would send her these files and she would say, no, this is not good enough. Amazon will reject it. And I had to redo it. And, but I'm like literally in the dark and I've got my iPad. I got my iPad with a, a version version of my book, which is, was more or less the final version, as you would expect. And I'm like, I'm reading. I read the whole thing. Oh, my mom texted me 57 minutes ago. Wants to know what time the live show is in tonight. Hang on. It's live now. And I read that thing. I mean, it was brutal reading that whole book. Oh, my word. Um, can't imagine what it's like to listen to it. So this is the book. Uh, Amazon does its own pricing kind of thing. Like I don't have complete control. They'll lower the price. $6.95 for a Kindle. I don't think that's too bad. Um, done pretty good. It's got like 4.7 out of 5. Um, 269 rate, rate ratings. And then uh, it's it's rated separately. The, audi the Audible book is rated about the same though, but it's a separate rating system. Let's see here. If I can find my book, why can't I find my book? Oh, because I'm in the wrong thing. <laughs> um, um, it's audible, not ACX is where I go to actually see how, if it's if it's selling. Audible is where you actually go to find the book. Let's see here. 4.7, 300 ratings. So that's not bad. Anyway, uh, back to your question. Any other recommendations from your channel or website? Well, from my channel, YouTube playlist. Well, you can just search the channel. Um, not from the website. I have started publishing a few things. Like I did a, a, a an article in the 712 portfolio, which I don't care for. And I'm actually having someone help me write some of those articles. I am going to do a video on the 712 portfolio. It's a, it's, it's a I guess it's a lazy portfolio. It doesn't look that lazy to me. It looks like a pain in the butt to manage, but um, but no, I don't think so. Now th there might be other YouTube channels. Uh, do I, ha I do I have any to recommend? The Money Guy Show is pretty good. You know them, the Money Guy Show. I know them from FinCon. Dave Ramsey versus the Money Guy. No, we don't need to hear about that, but they're pretty good. Um, I guess I can take the comment down. Uh, ben Felix uh, is good. We've talked about him. Um, what else did I have on here? That's about it. I don't. I don't listen to a lot of other finance-related YouTube channels. <laughs> Maybe I should. Um, Jeff says, "Rob, can you start over?" No, but I can put the scarf back on. It's actually hot. <laughs> All right. Make money is new here. Well, welcome. Uh, I don't have, Nicholas says, I've seen Russell 2000 get some flack as a small cap index. Thoughts? No, I don't have any. I mean, it is whatever it is, right? I mean, I don't know what the actual distribution is. is in the Russell 2000. Um, let's find a Russell 2000 ETF. What well, is the iShare? We'll just use that. What's the ticker? IWM. We've looked at this before, I think. Here it is. What's the portfolio? It's a small cap. So you mean you you mean it gets flack as not a good small cap? Maybe that's what you mean. I don't know. It's right in the middle. It's not a small cap value, which a lot of folks prefer small cap value. But I guess I don't have an opinion. So Steve wants to know how Fidelity offers his 1.2 million in FDIC insurance for the cash management service. 
I'm assuming that they spread the money out across multiple banks in some way. That's just an assumption. It's possible you can have you can have more than 250 at the same bank with different account ownerships and types. But I wouldn't think I would think it would be they'd spread it over more than one bank. Be my guess. All right. How are we doing on time? Is it 810? You know, the good news is Manning Cast, I think, is back tonight. Although my, my wife and I are in the middle of, a, of an episode of The Rookie. I like that show. I, I don't know. Is that embarrassing to admit? I am watching Peripherals, which would not be a show my wife would like. I really enjoy that kind of kind of TV. But Manning Cast, I mean, doesn't get better than that. Dave confirms that some CDs are callable. It makes sense that they would be. I've never invested in one, but... So Thorin says, I'm currently developmental, I'm editing my science fiction novel. Well, good for you. If someone stumbled upon an alternate universe, what would happen if they tried to use their existing credit debit card there? That's a good question. Um, I guess first we're assuming that in this alternate universe, they use credit and debit cards. So I've actually started my own novel, haven't gotten very far. And I will tell you, loosely speaking, I'll just tell you this about it. There is in this book, and I imagine it is a series. And by the way, it's it's not really about finance, but the bad guy in the first version, first book is a financial advisor, right? I mean, what do you expect from me? There is what I'll call I'll loosely call an alternate universe. And credit and debit cards are not used there. Oh, I know you're like, wow, Rob, now I got to read this. Nah, nah. Okay. So here's a question about bonds again. You guys and your fixed income. If I buy a five-year CD or a bond, do I get interest payments that I can withdraw when they get paid? Or do I get my principal and interest payments at once when it all matures? Well, for a typical bond, there are exceptions to this. You get interest payments every six months, typically. Treasury bills, you don't. They're, zero, they're called zero coupon bonds. You get the money at the end. But of course, they're all short term, right? They're less than a year. Um, with CDs, uh, at least the CDs that I've owned, I'm not sure. I'm trying to remember. It's been, I haven't owned a CD in years. I don't remember if they paid out the interest while you held the CD. They must have. But I, I, I don't recall that. And there, there could be differences. I'm not sure on the CD. I should know that. That feels like something I should know. I don't know it. All right. So yeah, someone is saying that the CDs we were looking at that have the higher yields are callable. So just bear that in mind as you're looking at the options, whether it's at Fidelity or any other broker. You guys are giving me shoulder uh, tips. I appreciate it. Shredder says, hanging from a bar is supposed to help. So I do hang from my pull-up bar not every day. Um, and there's a, a, a stretching routine that I do where you hang, you hang with one arm, which I can do, but not for long. And I'm always afraid of injury. Hanging from with two hands is not an issue, at least, you know, <laughs> until it is. Um, I'm hoping yoga and Pilates are going to help me. So Paul wants to know my thoughts on adding five to ten percent of QQQ. Uh, I'm just not a. a I'm, I've always been a fan of tilting my portfolio towards value, not towards growth. That's just been my my bias. It's consistent with how I invest when I buy individual stocks. So um, 
it wouldn't be an approach I would take, but I, I don't think it's a bad approach. I think if folks say, no, I, Rob, I hear you, but I'm, I'm the opposite. I prefer growth. The question is, you know, the QQQ is not just growth. It's high tech growth, right? And we can look at it. The way I would look at this, so if we go to portfolio, we can see, of course, that it's growth, large cap growth. But if you go down to sector, that's where you'll see it's, you know, 50% roughly. It's got other things, so it's not all tech, but it's clearly tilted towards tech. So it's a question of, you know, are you willing to accept that risk? Because remember, as well as QQQ has done, except for this year, and as well as tech has done in recent history, they can go a long time not doing well, as we all know. So you just have to be prepared for that. All right. So Mario is taking issue with my saying that a CD ladder is a pain to implement. He says it's a lot easier to implement than you described. For example, if you want to have CDs maturing every three months, all you need to do is buy three, six, nine, and 12. Well, that's assuming you want to, you, you, you're comfortable with just at, at the, once that ladder is up and going, you're comfortable with just one year CDs. But if you if you actually wanted five if you if you wanted the end result to be five year CDs because you like the higher yield, it would get more complicated. But yeah, I guess if you just want one year CDs, I think that's right. All right. So Steve, I have I've done a video on Vanguard. Uh, digital advisory service. I didn't care for it. I, uh, there was a lot of limitations. I had a lot of technical issues. Maybe it's better now than when I looked at it. But I did a video on it. You'll find it in the, in in the in my channel. I didn't um, I didn't use it long enough to have any tax loss harvesting kick kick in. I did with Betterment when I tried it. It worked fine. I'm sure. I'm going to assume the tax loss harvesting. But you say a, there's a human advisor involved. So I'm wondering if you've got the Vanguard advise 30 basis advisory services you may still see when you log in the digital advisory platform i think but you may have the 30 basis point uh, advisory service which is different than what i tested okay I'm going to randomly scroll down. Huh. So Mike says he seconds the idea of a form. So someone must have mentioned a form. A real one with organized threads, not Slack or Discord. Those become a jumbled mess. I'm not a fan of Discord. It, it is a jumbled mess. Um, I actually mentioned, uh, well, this is a little different. There, there is one platform card called Circle um, that I looked into. Part of it for me is, uh, and maybe, by the way, this wasn't in reference to me starting this form. Maybe this was in reference to someone else. I don't know. I would probably need a lot of help. It's just, I don't want it, to, it's a question of time. Oh, look at VJ's come in with some good info. By the way, VJ, we might get to, to play, uh, Michigan, Ohio State might get to play again. I know we have to beat Georgia. I know they're a pretty good team. I know we'll probably get crushed. I was surprised to learn today that they're only six and a half point favorites. Now that's probably changed from earlier in the day, but it's a home game for them. They're playing, we're playing in Georgia. So I would think just that alone would be worth a touchdown. But we could. Anyway, he says, great answer to the HGI question. This was a fixed uh, indexed annuity question. It's a multi-level marketing organization. Okay. More input. I didn't know that. All right. What else you guys got for me? Oh, how, I you know I, I start this um, poll and then I don't even look at it. 
What was the results? 77% used TurboTax, 17% H&R Block. Okay. Only 2% used TaxSlayer, 3% used Cash App. So maybe I'll focus on TurboTax and H&R Block. Maybe there are others that folks want me to look at. But um, thank you for doing that, for taking that poll. I am interested to see if I get the same result as my accountant. All right. So Andrew, I don't know what this was in, in reference to having it. This isn't a question for me, but I just found the comment interesting. He says, 60, just retired, have a 10-year cash cushion. Holy smokes, that's a sick... That's not a cash cushion. That's like a a cash, I don't even know what. Bungalow. It's like it's it's what surrounds the cushion. That's huge. And it's 30% of the portfolio. Interesting. Hmm. All right. Well. Interesting. Probably more cash than I would keep, but I, we, we each got to figure this out for ourselves, right? Muhammad asks a great question. He says, can you please explain the relationship or maybe the difference between buying a bond and holding it till maturity versus buying a bond index fund? So, Sure. So when you buy a bond, let's say you buy a treasury bond, it's a 10-year treasury bond, it's going to pay 4%. I'm just making that number up. If you hold it to maturity, you know, you're going to get your 4% every year, usually half every six months. And then in 10 years, you get your whatever you invested, your $1,000 back or however much you bought. Now, the value of that bond is going to go up and down. When I say value, I mean at any point in time during that 10-year period that you said, you know, I want to sell this $1,000 bond that pays 4% interest. It's very unlikely that the market will pay you exactly $1,000. They're going to pay you more or less, depending on how interest rates have changed. Have they gone up from 4%, right? In which case, you'll get less, right? Because why would I buy your 4% bond if I can go out and get another one that pay, you know, a new one that pays 6%, right? So you'd have to discount your bond to sell it. On the other hand, maybe rates go down to 2% and the value of your bond goes up. So you can actually get a premium. So the value of your bond is changing every single day, just like the value of a house is changing. But you may not choose to sell. Okay, so you don't sell. It doesn't mean the value is not changing. Uh, but if you don't sell and you hold it to maturity, um, you get your money back. Now, one thing to note about that we shouldn't gloss over. When you bought that 10-year bond, uh, it had a maturity of 10 years, right? In 10 years, it's going to mature, meaning that's when you get your last interest payment and your $1,000 back. The duration of that bond is sort of the weighted average time it will take you to get all your money back, keeping in mind that, yeah, you got to wait 10 years for the 1,000, but along the way, you're going to get some interest payments. And so if we were to try to calculate a weighted average uh, a time for you to get all your money back. It'd be something less than 10 years. Don't know what it would be. By the way, the higher the interest rate or yield, uh, the shorter the duration for, this, for the same 10-year bond, right? Because in other words, the bigger the interest payments that you get along the way, the shorter the duration. But whatever the duration is, let's say it's eight years. Let's make something up. As time goes by, you started with a 10-year bond, a year later, you don't have a 10-year bond. You have a nine-year bond, right? It's nine years left. And then you have an eight-year bond. Then you have a seven-year bond. And of course, the duration is shrinking too. Um, the point there being uh, that the, the maturity and duration of your, your bond portfolio, which consists of this single bond for our sake, our sake of our discussions, is constantly changing, right? And, 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 and over time, in extreme ways, at one point you were at 10 years, eventually you're going to be at 10 days, 
and then eventually it's going to mature. A bond fund, at least a lot of bond, not all bond funds, but say the most of the ones we talk about, they're what would be considered a duration targeted bond fund. They don't want to happen to their fund, what I just described with your single bond. They don't want drastic changes in the overall maturity and duration of the fund. They want to keep it within a range. And they do that by buying and selling bonds, right? So they might buy a bond with a certain maturity and duration, but they might not hold it till maturity. It gets, because once it gets down to, we'll just make up a number, three years, oh, that's too short now. We got to sell it and go out and buy a five-year bond or a seven-year so we can keep this target duration. B and D is like six and a half year duration. So they want to keep it somewhere in that range. So they're constantly buying and selling bonds to do that. Um, and so with, with bond index funds or bond funds in general, a lot of people get upset and I get it because the bond can go down in value it's it's quoted you know on the exchange you see your mutual fund or your your etf just like this year and it's down 10% You're like well if i owned you know an individual bond this wouldn't happen well actually yeah it would that individual bond went down in value but then they say okay but i but i can hold it to maturity well don't sell your bond fund yeah but the bond fund doesn't have a maturity it's sort of a perpetual constantly keeping the duration within the range of whatever the fund's goal is, say six and a half years in our hypothetical, it doesn't have a maturity. So you can't hold it to maturity. It never matures. They keep buying and selling. But we know based on duration, we can get a rough idea that over a certain period of time, the fund is going to return its starting yield. I mean, starting being like we go over that same 10-year period. Whatever the yield was when we bought it, the fund, the duration times two minus one roughly is going to be the return for that period. Just like we know the return for an individual bond. So I think buying individual bonds is a perfectly reasonable approach. I, I'm not, I'm personally not a phrase, the wrong word, concerned about bond funds in the way that a, a lot of other people are for kind of the reasons I just explained. I'm not looking to sell the bond fund anytime soon just like I wouldn't sell an individual bond anytime soon. But at a high level, that gives you some idea of the differences. I'm sure there's a lot more that could be said. By the way, I encourage you to subscribe to the newsletter. I, in, in one recent one, I had an article on this very issue. I don't remember if they explained it the way I did. I'm sure they didn't. They probably did a better job. Okay. I'm, I'm exhausted after that. It's 8.28. It's also a little cold in here. I gotta put this back on for the end of the show. Can you see the Ohio State Championship 2014? Does that come in? Or I gotta get the okay. I know we're gonna get crushed. But at least in the words of Teddy Roosevelt, at least we're in the arena. Yeah? Okay. All right. Any last interesting uh questions or comments that I can find in Let's see. Josh says, I love the list of predictions. I'm glad you're doing it. Uh, you know, it's something you guys might want to do. You know, if you find that you're really drawn to some public person, investor, analyst, or whatever, if they're a big, big at predicting, uh, keep track of them. Also, keep track of your fears or your, your thinking. I think long-term bonds are a good buy right now because blah, 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 blah. And set a note to look at that again in six months, whether you buy or you don't buy. It's like journaling, keeping a little journal about your thoughts on investing. All right. What else we got before I call it a night? Janice, thank you for the, the, the marketing. I appreciate it. Um, uh, Noreen asks, is it, did I, am I the one that, yeah, my voice, it's me. If you buy the audio book, it's me. Trust me. It's me. Painful. No, it was not that bad, but it was, it was tedious. 
All right. So um, the pan, as in Peter, has anyone read Rob's book and the Bogled Guide to Investing book? Interesting in comparison. I've read them both. Um, the Bogled Guide is a great book. I highly recommend it. It's more focused on... My book goes into sort of the behavioral side of trying to build wealth. I think probably more than the Boglehead Guide to Investing book does. And thinking through things like getting started, how, you know, how, how, how can you spend less than you make? How can you make changes in your life to do that? But I don't know. By the way, I'm not suggesting that makes it better or not. I think the Bogolet Guide to Investing is a phenomenal book. Um, highly recommend it. What else we got? Well, it's, it's 831. Man, it goes by quick. I'm actually a little cold now. I'm kind of glad I put this thing on. Um So Rick wants to know, I'll make this the last question. By the way, we'll have some more videos this week, hopefully. You know, Lord willing and the creek don't rise. Um, and the first one I want to get out is on Jeppy and other covered call ETFs. But uh, are you familiar with bond funds that hold a variety of credit-rated corporate bonds with specific maturity date windows so that you can hold until the maturity? Yeah, there's, there's, there's a couple. We've looked at these in the past. Bullet shares is one. So the way these work... Um, let's see. Well, I guess let's see if we can pull. Well, actually, okay. So here's one. So this is. So this, which this is, these are corporate bonds. Um, they have high yield. They have they have others, but so we'll look at uh, this one, 2025. So the way this works is, this fund will actually shut down at the end of 2025. Think of this fund as maturing like a bond would at the end of 2025. Let me take the comment down. And you get all your money back. It even tells you that here. Let's see. Somewhere. Right here. The fund has a designated year of maturity of 2025 and will terminate on or about December 15th, 2025. So you could create a, a, a bond ladder of these ETFs if you wanted to, right? It's got a nice... 30 day yield, but this is, um, keep in mind that we're looking at junk bond, right? That's what high yield means. Um, doesn't mean it's bad, by the way, it's just risky. So that's one. I bonds, not the I bonds, but I bonds ETF. This is, um, let me pull it up. It's from iShares. I, think it, I, I don't know why they called it I bonds. <laughs> it's too confusing, but these are, um, the same kind of thing. Let's see if I can find an example. Hmm. Oh, here we go. So you see they have the years that these funds are going to mature. They've got U.S. Treasuries, municipals, investment grade, and high yield. So if we go to U.S. Treasuries, here's a 2028. It's going to do the same thing. So those are two examples. Yeah, you could build, you know, if if you wanted sort of if 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 buying individual bonds and holding them to maturity appeals to you, but you'd rather not go off buying individual bonds, then you could look at these iShares, i bonds, or the bullet shares as, as options. I've not personally invested in either, but I would if that's kind of what I was trying to achieve. So there you go. Well, gang, um, as always, thank you for joining. It's always a lot of fun, at least for me. I mean, it may be torture for you. Um, I'll put up this comment uh, to end the show from Corrales Cruiser, Go Bucks, OH. Now, when anyone yells at you, OH, what do you say? IO. It's a, it's Ohio thing. I mean, look, it's Ohio. We, we ain't got a lot going for us. I mean, at least we got this. Although the Bengals, they looked pretty good, I got to tell you. Anyway, gang, thank you. Hope you have a great week. I will have some more videos this week. Should be back next Monday, Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. And uh, yeah, until then, have a great week. And remember, the best thing money can buy.
is financial freedom. And tickets to the Ohio State-Georgia game 